UVA edges Virginia Tech in the latest edition of the school's basketball rivalry as an unlikely hero emerges for the Cavaliers. Where do both teams go from here? That, more shuffling in the ACC basketball standings, and the Hokies and Who's football teams fill out their coaching staffs. This week on Teal and Barber. Welcome in to episode 73 of Teal and Barber, the Richmond Times Dispatch and Richmond.com's Virginia Tech, UVA, and ACC Sports Podcast. I'm Mike Barber, ACC beat writer for the paper, and joining me here as always, my co host, the 13 time sports writer of the year and the Virginia Sports Hall of Famer, David Teal. David, you are, I believe, joining us from your hotel room. So uh, good to hear from you, and thanks for doing that. Sure, man. I was going to say episode 73, but perhaps the first in which we're recording in the same city. Right. We're getting closer and closer uh, to the to the dream of, of being together in a, in a studio or something. And I probably should have just had you come over and uh, have some breakfast and, and we could have huddled here in the office. But this this will work well. And uh, we've had a bunch going on in the house uh, the last week and a half. We had my birthday a week ago and, and my wife's birthday is today. So uh, in case she listens, happy birthday, Elizabeth. We love you. Uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit about birthdays, David. What what uh, what are birthdays like in the Teal household? Do you guys have a, a go out for dinner, a cook a dinner? Is there a go-to meal when, when you add another uh, year on the old calendar? I guess I'll find out tomorrow since it's Jill's birthday. Uh, <laughs> How about, happy but, birthday, Jill. Yeah, absolutely. We don't do much. We'll go out to dinner. I doubt we'll go out to, tomorrow night. We'll probably do some uh, in-home dining, get some good carry out. But it's usually pretty low key around our house, unless it's the little one's birthday. Now, naturally, that that takes it up another level. But you know, it's funny. I, my kids are to the point where they're both now excited by by mom and dad's birthdays, and um, my wife is unbelievable when she bakes cakes. And um, my daughter helped me kind of try to try to answer the challenge, and we we put together a cake that was certainly tasty. Uh, it wasn't quite as aesthetically stunning as, as some of the works of art my, my wife puts together. But what about for your birthday, David? Is there a dinner? Is there something you have to have on your birthday? A glass of red wine will do just fine. That sounds phenomenal. I had red wine with my lasagna. That is always my uh, my meal of choice. And Elizabeth always changes. So this this year she actually asked for, and I was very grateful. Uh, we were talking before we started recording with our producer, uh, Dean Hoffmeyer, about the, the incoming snow. I was very grateful for the fact that uh, we got some decent weather yesterday because Elizabeth wanted uh, cheeseburgers on the grill. So ah. we, we grilled up some cheeseburgers before I came out. Uh, to see you, David, at JPJ for uh, what ended up being, I, I thought, not maybe not the most beautiful basketball game ever, but I thought a wildly entertaining one. It was. I mean, neither team led by double digits. There were 13 lead changes, nine of them in the second half, 10 ties. You know, at, at one point you turned and, and, and looked at me and said, could you please tell me who's going to win here so I can start framing my story on deadline? Uh, Mike, I got nothing for you. I got no clue. Yeah, usually a game like that will, will throw you, a, I like to say, will throw you a red herring. Like somebody will take that uh, 10 or 12 point lead and then you start banging out your story and then it goes away and you end up having to trash the whole thing anyway. But we didn't even get that. They, they were, you're right. They were right within a couple shots of each other all night. Um, some some big plays, some big defensive stops. Um, it, it was interesting, David. I'll tell you, after watching Virginia lose at Carolina, I think we both thought, and I think Tony Bennett thought, man, we could be in for a, a long night with Keve Aluma. Um, he even said on, on the conference call, I think it was Monday, that um, Keve Aluma must have been licking his chops watching the, the video from Baycoat, uh, Armando Baycoat going off against them. And right from the start, that was kind of where Tech went. Aluma had a, a huge game for them. How did Virginia survive in spite of that? Well, two things, Mike. Number one, oh, and we have a lot of sirens here go, go, going by the hotel, so excuse the, the sound effects, Dean. Oh, and now they're really close. But uh, number one, Keve Aluma went off against UVA last season yeah. to the tune of 29 and 10. So you knew he was looking forward to this. On top of watching video of, of Baycott have his way with the Cavaliers on Saturday. But the way Virginia contained Aluma last night was being physical. 
And who's the most physical presence on the UVA roster? None other than Francisco Cafaro, all seven foot one, two hundred forty-two pounds up. Yeah, and and I'll tell you what, you know, we joked on many nights actually that there was going to be a Francisco Cafaro game, right? There was going to be a game where he came in and 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 was the difference. Now I don't know if when I talked about that. I saw 16 and nine. I probably saw the nine, <laughs> yeah. um, but maybe I would have thought more, the next big number would have been on his foul line. He had some touch around the basket. He did some things effectively, but he was bruising. Um, he was a bull. He was everything I thought that they needed at Carolina and couldn't find. Um, he did it at another level, I thought, in this game. And he did it early, David, because Caden Shedrick picked up a foul on the very first possession of the game. He picked up his second foul less than three minutes later. So here we are three minutes into this big rivalry game with the presence of Keve Aluma and Caden Shedrick is on the bench with two fouls. Kafaro comes in and, and you could, you didn't know it then, but it was the defining moment of the game really. And, and maybe in an odd way to Virginia's advantage uh, that Shedrick got that second foul. Within five minutes, Mike, Kafaro had five points and three rebounds. I, I mean, believe. just instant impact. And also on on the defensive end, you know, you you mentioned Aluma had a big game for the Hokies. He had twenty two and six and and three assists, but he worked for all twenty two of those points. He was nine for twenty yeah. from and the floor. I thought it was interesting. You heard Kafaro in the post game describe him as as a volume shooter, <laughs> which uh, you don't generally think of for a post presence. But um, he was. He took twenty shots, and yeah, he got his points. But um, they they played very good defense, especially Kafaro on Aluma. Um, so don't let the twenty two points fool you. Aluma had a great game, played phenomenally, um, but three turnovers, eleven missed shots, um, three times they had him out shooting from three point range. He hit one of those. Aluma only took three free throws in the game. Jaden Virginia Gardner Tech only took three free throws. They were the all all for his team. Jaden Gardner didn't take a free throw for UVA. You might look at those numbers if you didn't watch the game and say, okay, the two premier low post scores in the game combined for three free throws. It was a finesse game. David, it was not a finesse game. They let these guys go at it. They absolutely did. Much to Mike Young's chagrin. Uh, he he did not mask it at at all in, in post game. He was very clear it didn't decide the game, but he said flat out it was more physical than Virginia Tech is accustomed to, and he raised an eyebrow at the lack of calls a couple times at the rim. There was one sequence, and I didn't think this was a foul. But there was one sequence, Mike, there in the second half where Kafaro and Shedrick were actually on the floor at the same time. Mm -hmm. And and Shedrick is checking Aluma, but gets lost in rotation. And Aluma catches the ball on the right wing, and there's just this clear path to the basket. And he starts to go, and he elevates, and Kafaro, who was checking Gardner, or, or no, Kafaro, who was checking Justin Mutz, he slides over to help and basically meets him midair. Mm -hmm. And and they are chest to chest midair, and that challenge and was there contact? Yes, that contact caused Aluma to miss. To to me, it was the defensive play of the game, and and really kind of embodied the whole night for UVA. Yeah, there were a couple of those sequences where you certainly could have called a foul. Mm -hmm. uh, either way, I mean, the offensive guys were going hard, the defensive guys were, but I did think that. And again, you, know, you go back and, and the free throw disparity, Virginia took 16 free throws. Uh, Kafaro had 10 of those attempts, made six of them. Um, the disparity, I can see why fans get upset, but I, I thought from really the word go, although we did just talk about Shedrick getting two fouls in the first three minutes, it, it was pretty clear that they were going to let them play a mm -hmm. physical brand of basketball. I thought both teams did a good job of, of kind of being straight up. Um, there was a lot of body hitting body and, and that isn't always a foul. It doesn't always have to be a foul. And uh, for whatever reason, uh, Ted Valentine and uh, who else was it? Mar Marcy and Porter, I think. Uh, yeah. Th they they decided <laughs> we're going to let them play big boy basketball. And David, they played some big boy basketball. They, they sure did. And I give Kafaro a ton of credit, Mike. He played 19 minutes at Carolina on Saturday. He had no rebounds. 
think he heard about that. Yeah. What, from, what, from, from what was coaches? your line in the story you've been working on? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When you're seven, one and two forty, you ought to get a couple rebounds by accident. <laughs> I love that. And <laughs> it's, it's true. And then last night he plays career high, 31 minutes, nine boards, career high, 16 points. And, uh, you know, he had that, he had that one spin move in the post around Gardner and, you know, I was like, wow, you know, he, he does have a, a little bit of not much now, but, but a little bit of uh, f- finesse when, when he needs to. Um, so it's going to be interesting moving forward to see if he can uh, sustain it because, you know, two games ago at Clemson, yeah, he was three for three from the floor, two for two from the line, eight points. You know, th- that kind of production from him, I think you can expect on a more routine basis, not 16 and nine, right. but you know, six, eight, 10 points. Yeah. I think this is a different basketball team if he's good for eight and eight every night. I mean, it doesn't sound like a ton, eight and eight, but one, UVA plays those low possession games. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and just to have that other body, Shedrick has struggled with the foul trouble. Um, I think it changes things. Now, another person who's struggled in one area, Armand Franklin, he was one for four from three. He has not been the lights out three point shooter that UVA fans were promised when he transferred from Indiana. David, I don't think it's a stretch to say he's been outstanding for Virginia except for the three-pointers. And, and he had 15 points in this game, five rebounds, uh, three assists. He played really good defense. He's really uh, embracing and starting to fit into the pack line. I've been really impressed with Armand Franklin's ability to help uh, at a very high level Virginia, despite not having the three ball in his arsenal right now. 31 minutes, no turnovers. Mm-hmm. And he went four for four from the line. Yeah. He was really, really good last night, as was Reese Beekman. Now, I mean, they well, both had incredibly similar lines, both five for 11 from the floor, both of them five rebounds. Beekman had five assists, only one turnover, and 11 points. They were both exceptional last night. Absolutely. Beekman also had the two steals that, yep. that allowed uh, Virginia, I think, both times to get out in transition and score. And, um, you know, that's what the kind of the vision of this team, right? Jaden Gardner. He only had four points and five boards. He took 10 shots. They did a, a nice job. It was obviously they were very focused on Jaden Gardner uh, and, and other guys were able to, to get going and do some things. Uh, but with Jaden Gardner, you figure is going to get his on the low block. If you can get Beekman scoring in transition and driving to the basket, uh, and then you get some of these other pieces, Franklin doing the different things he's doing. If he ever gets the three ball back, Clark is as always kind of that scorer when you need him. He only had six, but um, you know, in big moments, you can put the ball in his hands. And then we just talked about if you know Kafaro can be a, a consistent factor. This team is starting to find an identity. Is it a a beautiful identity? Tony Bennett said, "You know, we're not pretty. This is who we are." But I think they're starting to find who they are. Well, sitting there four and two in the league, which is not a not a terrible place. <clears throat> a very interesting and different challenge coming up Saturday at home against Wake Forest. Whereas Aluma was this low post presence the Cavaliers had to worry about. Saturday they get more of a slashing perimeter guy in Alondis Williams from Wake Forest, who is threatening right now to become the first player in ACC history to lead the league in scoring and assists. Yeah, and that that is a, a skill set that normally is reserved for, for guards, right? For for small guys, point guard mm-hmm. types. And um, yeah, it's a different different challenge. And he's been, I think, better than certainly advertised and, and oh, as has yeah. Wake Forest. And we'll get into it in a, in a little bit here, some of the ebbs and flows in the ACC. But um, it will be an interesting challenge. And, and I, I feel like if Virginia uh, at home can win that game, then suddenly it's there's a lot less doom and gloom than there was uh, after Carolina or, or certainly after that first Clemson loss. Nope, agreed. And and another thing, you know, we, we talked just about Cafaro and his inside presence last night, but just in, in total, Mike, Virginia gave up 14 second chance points mm-hmm. at Carolina last night, two. Huge. Huge. What, a, what, a, what a difference. And everybody we asked joked about, you know, was it a point of emphasis? <laughs> I think yeah. you asked Coach Bennett. Uh, we asked Francisco Cafaro. We asked Armand Franklin. They all kind of laughed. At, yeah, you think? You, you think that was a, a, a something we talked a little bit about? And, um, and yeah, and Cafaro was a huge part of that turnaround and uh, coming off the bench. And, and that brings us to this week's edition 
of who you got. Thank you, Mike. Let's go right back to my domain in basketball land, and that was the bench. <laughs> Virginia has gotten some big games from almost everybody on its bench at one point or another this season. But can any of those players emerge as a consistent scoring threat? Who you got? Let's start with David. Guys, I don't know if anybody's going to be the alpha male off the bench night in and night out. You know, Tane Murray had the, the big game against Iowa. He didn't even scratch last night. Did, did not play a minute. You know, there are moments when, when Cody Statman can can knock down some jumpers, and he had one last night. But if you, if you ask the one guy who's going to almost certainly get his chances every night was last night's unexpected hero, and that's Francisco Cafaro. Thank you, David. Mike? Yeah, I, I agree. I think Cafaro's the guy that's going to have the most chances. I just don't, I, even after last night, I can't close my eyes picture him and think consistent scoring threat. Right. Uh, but I think you're right. I mean, you look at Statman, I think he can give you a lift at times. Uh, Carson McCorkle uh, played very little. He can give you a lift at times. I, my guy's still Igor Milicic Jr. I, I think he is... I think he is one of those guys that is really making rapid progress as the year goes. And you mentioned Tane Murray. Like him, Milicic Jr. didn't get in the game yesterday. A real tight bench, real short bench. I mean, McCorkle played a minute 50, so he yeah. didn't really play. I mean, they went too deep on their bench. Kafaro and Statman and um, didn't get much from Statman. So who I who do I got? I'm going to take Milicic Jr., and I'm talking about late February, March for this to happen. I, I just, I, I think there will be some guys who can contribute off the bench, but consistent scoring from there, I think you got to look to your starting five for that. Now, when we're talking about the bench and Oof. production or lack thereof, yeah. David, Virginia Tech is getting nothing right now from the guys who aren't in the starting five. Last night, they got two points from John Ogiaco. It came with about eight minutes to go in the game. That was it for bench points. And you shared uh, an even more glaring statistic about the lack of punch they're getting from their subs. Four ACC games, Mike. 18 points combined from the reserves. Just, it's it's unsustainable. It, it just won't work. And Mike Young said as much last night. He said it's, it's his job to figure out a way to get more from the likes of David Gasson, Darius Maddox, Sean Padula, John Ogiaco. G- Got to get something from them, especially given that Naheem Aline's funk continues. Now, he knocked down a couple threes in the second half last night, but still, you know, two for five from the floor, that makes him 17 of 69. Uh, over his last eight games. Yeah, and, and you know, it's funny. I, I look on Twitter and I have so many followers saying, why, why don't they bench him? Why don't oh. they move him out of the starting lineup? For who? Right. Who do you put? It's not like Mike Young's asleep at the wheel here, right? <laughs> um, there aren't options. There aren't pieces. I, I think David Gasson can still be a great player, but he just he hadn't done much this year. And um, David, you and I were in Indianapolis a, a year ago for the NCAA tournament. And the game in, in a defeat, but the game that Naheem Aleen had uh, in Tech's first round loss, I thought he was on the verge of absolute stardom. And it, it just, it hasn't happened. Nope. Not, it's certainly not on the offensive side. And, you know, the, the people who would suggest to you, Mike, that they, they bench Aleen for someone else neglect to understand or to acknowledge how good he is defensively. Yeah. And Virginia Tech is one of the better defensive teams in the league. And one of the primary reasons is Naheem Ali. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, I, I think for Mike Young right now, you hang your hat on two things. You hang your hat on that defense and you hang your hat on Kevin Aluma. Now, is that enough, David? Because they're 0-4 in the league for the first time since 2014-15. That was Buzz Williams' first year yeah. in, in Blacksburg, the former coach who's now at A&M. So the results tell me no. David, is Aluma and great defense going to be enough to, to get Virginia Tech through this season? No. They're going <laughs> to, in short, so many more guys have to become consistent. You know, Storm Murphy has got to get better at the point. You know, Hunter Couture last night I thought was really good. Mm-hmm. You know, 
what did he end up with? 10 points, five assists, six boards, three steals. I mean, I know he missed the three there at the end that would have would have won the game. It was a good look, and he's a good shooter. But the Hokies are just going to need, you know, night in, night out. And they're not going to win games when Justin Mutz takes two shots. Yeah. Two. Yeah. You know, there's always something to be said for being unselfish and moving the basketball, and, and Mutz had a pair of assists. But, I mean, the two things you got to look at is, one, Justin Mutz is better than that. He needs to get his shots. He needs to be aggressive. And, two, look at the way that game was going. Um, you know, I, I think it was clear that, you know, Murphy wasn't on fire. Couture wasn't on fire. Uh, Aluma, while he was great, he was missing a ton of shots. There there were moments where you'd think, hey, get, get Mutz a, a ball or um, – even a stick back, right? I, what did he finish with? Four rebounds? I don't think any were on the offensive end. Um, they, they needed a lot more from him. And, you know, it's funny, David. Going into the year, I, I said I thought Virginia Tech was going to come out really hot, be one of the best teams early. Um, Virginia maybe could catch them as the year went on. But I thought when I looked at Aluma, Mutz, Couture, Elaine, Murphy, I thought that, that's as good a five as, as you're going to find. Elaine hasn't lived up to it. Murphy's been hit or miss. Mutz hit or miss. Nothing from the bench, which was the concern. Um, I think it's fair at, at this point uh, to start worrying about Mike Young's Hokies. I know he said, you know, we're going to keep trying. He said that if they play as connected and as hard-nosed as they did uh, in the loss to Virginia, they'd be okay. They'd win some games in the ACC. David, I'm, I'm not so sure, but that does bring us to this week's edition of Take It or Leave It. Despite its 0-4 start in ACC play, Virginia Tech will still make the NCAA tournament. Take it or leave it. Let's start with Mike. I'm going to leave it, and I'm going to leave it on two fronts. Number one, they're 0-4 in league play, as Dean just pointed out. So uh, that's a big hole to climb out of. Now, the other point, and we're going to get into it here in a little bit, is how far down the perception of the ACC is. So could this team still fight its way to being in eighth place in the league, seventh place in the league? Yeah, I think that's still possible. The way they play defense, the way Aluma scores, I could see them 7th or 8th in the ACC if they, if they can get some other things working and some other things going. The problem is, I don't know that 7th or 8th place in the ACC puts you in the NCAA tournament. I don't know that just getting a 500 in the ACC, which used to be a, a pretty good key to open the door to get in the NCAAs, I don't know that it gets it done. Uh, so that my concern is twofold. Yes, I have major concerns about Virginia Tech, what they're doing on the floor, what they have, will they be able to find the answers. But even if they find some of those answers, I just don't know that the ACC's reputation is going to afford them the opportunity uh, to make the big dance. Thank you. David? Like I'm going to leave it as well, simply because the the 0 and 4 hole is too steep a climb. Syracuse went from 0 and 4 to 9 and 9, and eventually the Final Four in 2016. <laughs> 10 and 10 in the league. Now that the schedule is is 20 games. A, a 500 record, as as you mentioned, probably isn't going to get you in the NCAA tournament. Now Virginia Tech is still number 39. On the net after last night, that's a pretty darn good ranking, uh, given their given their record. But e- even at eleven and nine, if if they go eleven and nine, they're gonna have to they're gonna have to win eleven of their next sixteen conference games. And let's not forget now with that rescheduled North Carolina contest, the Hokies have a bunch of games in very few days coming up. You know, Saturday at home against Notre Dame, then Wednesday in Raleigh against NC State, return home Saturday for Boston College, then Monday at Carolina, then Wednesday against Miami. I mean, that's followed by a a Saturday game at Florida State. So, got to leave it. Yeah, I I don't blame you. And and this is a stretch, David, that feels like, yes, it it could make the Hokie season. They could turn it around and um, figure things out. And and, and they're going to, they will win some games then that are going to make people say, okay, that's what we expected. This could also be a stretch that just buries them. Um, And in some ways, through no fault of their own, right? Like if they were 4-0, and this stretch could put them in a big hole. They're 0-4. This stretch could bury them, and um, they're struggling. But, but David, we watch a lot of ACC basketball, you and I. They're not alone in struggling. They're not alone in inconsistency. And, I mean, just you know, look at some of these recent games here. We had Miami, who I thought was kind of the, the surprise, uh, the great story. They beat Duke 
They turn around and lose to Florida State, who was maybe the other surprise in terms of not living up to expectations. You got Wake Forest. They they had a hot start. They were the team that I think people were, wow, look at Wake Forest now. Uh, put them up there with Miami as a surprise. Well, now they're down to three and three in the league, and, and honestly, we're not very competitive uh, against Duke last night. Don't know what to make of Louisville who I thought was maybe the team I keep saying that they're the team I'm looking at, and then NC State uh, gets them convincingly at home. Uh, Notre Dame, who you just mentioned, coming to Tech, they're hot. What have they won, David? Six in a row? Yeah. Yeah, and, and you mentioned Carolina kind of figuring things out. What do we make of of what's going on right now in the ACC? Are, are these a lot of good teams knocking each other down, or are these a lot of average teams knocking each other around? Uh, your definition of good. <sighs> <laughs> That's that's tough. Here's Duke and Carolina are really good, like Final Four good. I know Miami won at Cameron the other night. Miami's got great guards. Miami's not Final Four good. Duke and Carolina are. No one else is. Um, can can some other teams make noise in March? Sure. Miami, UVA. Uh, I don't know that I go much deeper than that. What do you, what do you make of Notre Dame? And, and set aside for a minute the fact that we both think Mike Bray is a national treasure. And if you <laughs> if you haven't seen the tweet of him standing up in the dining hall, uh, oh exhorting the student body to come out and support the team, uh, go check it out. But you know that that is I mean they're a fun team to watch. They've got some some veteran players back. Uh, like I said, six in a row. They're on fire right now. Going into the game with Tech. What do you make of Notre Dame? just don't think they're good enough defensively. Um, they're really fun on offense. They, I mean, Dane Goodwin had, a, had another big night last night. You know, Paul Atkinson, the, the transfer from Yale, uh, is, is, is giving them a, a, an inside presence. You know, they got one of the best freshmen in the league there in the backcourt, the local kid from South Bend. Um, but I just... I got to I got to see more that I keep remembering that the Fighting Irish lost their ACC opener to Boston College and that just I, it's hard to get that out of my head. That's that's more in the knocking them around category and all right, how about Louisville because you you know that I like Louisville and and um, you also know that anytime I praise anybody too effusively on this podcast uh, they come out and, and get thumped and certainly a 16-point home loss to NC State. I know, right? Counts as a thumping. That's two in a row. They lost at Florida State, who we both went into the year thinking would be much uh, better than they've been. What do you make of Louisville? No, I, I don't see that as a, a, even an NCAA tournament team right now. Just wildly inconsistent and, you know, Williams, Williamson, they've been kind of all over the map. They're good defensively, not so good on the offensive end. Uh, yeah, the, there, there's some skill there, but no, not impressed. So before we, we get to February and March, where we're actually parsing resumes and really looking at the metrics for who could, when you just look at, at this league, and let's take Duke and Carolina out of it, because I think we both think that you know they are uh, the elite of the conference right now. Who else is NCAA tournament caliber? Doesn't mean they're going to get it done. Uh, doesn't mean they can advance. But but who do you see it right now as NCAA tournament caliber? Miami for sure. I think Virginia will will get there just because Tony Bennett. He he figures it out and. His team believes in him, and rightfully so. And belief will carry you a long way. I'm not sure any of the other teams we've talked about, with the possible exception of Virginia Tech, has that belief from experience that, yeah, we're, we're going to get there. We're good enough. Um, eventually, though, and, and I've been remiss probably in, in not mentioning Florida State. Because you know, the, the Knolls got to the Sweet 16 last year. Leonard is, you talk about Bray being a treasure. So too is is Leonard Hamilton down in Tallahassee. And that group with, with the transfers, including Caleb Mills from Houston, you know, I think they're starting to, to, to figure it out. That was a pretty gutsy win the other night. 
against Miami. You know, Raquan Evans goes to the line with 0.8 seconds to go, down one's got to make them both, and darn if he doesn't. Uh, that's that's pretty impressive in, in, in clutch there. He's one of their veteran guys. Anthony Polite had a, had a big game against Miami. He gives them some some veteran leadership. I think that's another team, much like UVA, Mike, that just believes be, because they've done it before. Yeah, we'll remember, you know, back in what was it, week two of the season when I said I thought Florida State was the second best team and then um, absolutely got it put on them by Purdue. Uh, but this is a team, David, that they had, what, three straight games canceled or postponed. Central Florida, North Florida, one of the, one of the directional Floridas, and Boston College um, postponed or canceled due to COVID issues. Since then, They've won three out of four. They won at NC State. They took a lopsided road loss at Wake. Yeah. Beat Louisville and beat Miami right when Miami was was riding as high as they've been. Um, yeah, I, I think that this is still a Florida State team um, that is NC. You know, the question was NCA caliber. Yeah. I think they're NCA caliber. Um, I think Clemson is NCA caliber. Now, do they get it done at, at ten and six right now? Two and three in the league. I don't know. But, but when I watch. Be- didn't you think they'd be more competitive last night in South I re- Bend? Really did. I really did, and and that's part of what made me maybe sway a little more in my opinion of Notre Dame is I have a high opinion of Clemson. Yeah. Um, and I was, and and particularly David Clemson defensively, and I know we talk about Notre Dame's deficiency defensively, but how good is Notre Dame's offense? The fact that they were able to do it against Clemson mm-hmm. to me is a major feather in their cap. So um, I wouldn't rule out. You, you know, you mentioned Miami. I think you're right. I wouldn't rule out Notre Dame. Uh, I certainly wouldn't rule out rule out Florida State. I wouldn't rule out either of the Virginia schools. Um, Clemson, Wake, Louisville are, are going to be interesting. I, I think we're going to get to the end with – I think it's going to be a lot, honestly, David, like ACC football. We got to the end of the regular season, and there were a ton of bowl-eligible <laughs> ACC teams. But they were all pretty much 500 or a game above, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, there was, a, And it was hard when we were trying to predict the bowl matchups. Because everybody was six and six, and one team was seven and five. I think that's what we're heading for. I think you're looking at a Duke team that can be a one seed, a Carolina team that could be a, a one, maybe more likely a two seed. Um, and then I think you're looking at a bunch of guys that are going to be in Joe Lenardi's bubble bracket talk uh, for the final weeks, and and how you play at the end may matter. So uh, it's going to be interesting. I, I think it's going to be fun. I think. Again, say what you want to say about last night's game. It was wildly entertaining. I think the ACC is going to give us, David, a lot of that here over the next two months. Agreed. Yeah, the uh, the the average margin of victory is, is going to be thin indeed for most folks. This is fun to watch. Not always fun to write on deadline, but um, <laughs> you know, 9 o'clock start is fine because deadline was so far in our rearview mirror uh, that, that we didn't have to worry. But uh, yeah, looking forward to... Uh, madness long before we, we get to March, which is going to be fun. David, before we get out of here, let's talk a little college football because it's always college football season. And Virginia Tech and UVA, that they're rounding out their coaching staffs. Uh, we've seen some more official hires. Some of the names that, that were rumored became done deals. Uh, where do you want to start and, and what's jumping out to you right now in, in the way Brent Pry at Tech uh, and Tony Elliott at UVA are putting together their coaching staffs? Well, I guess I'd start with what I think is the most recent news uh, on the coaching front and that's Virginia Tech hiring a Cavalier yeah, how about that as its receivers coach Fontel Mines uh, a Hermitage High graduate and who spent this past season coaching the tight ends at Old Dominion for Ricky Ronnie Brent Prize former co-worker at Penn State Fontel Mines going to Blacksburg to live on the other side of the street of the Commonwealth rivalry. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. He's such an effective recruiter, David, you know it, especially in that 757 area. And now he can say, I've been at Virginia, I've been at Old Dominion, and I think you should come to Virginia Tech. That That's a heck of a, a pitch right there, right? It is. And our, our, our colleague from the Daily Progress, Greg Medea, was singing Mines' praise to us because he said Mines was a terrific recruiter for James mm-hmm. Madison back when Greg was covering the program and got a bunch of guys from not only the, the Hampton Roads area, but also in his in his native Richmond. 
And that's that's going to be essential. I mean, Brent Pry has said over and over, and so too has, has Tony Elliott at UVA, what a priority in-state recruiting will be for these new staffs. So I was I was really struck by by the Mines hire. I had a chance to talk with him at length during preseason over at, at Old Dominion. He's he's very engaging, impressive guy. <clears throat> Spent some time on some NFL practice squads, uh, specifically with with the Chicago Bears. And uh, you know he, you know, you talk about a guy who's coached at a bunch of different levels. He's he started coaching at Shawan and gradually worked his way up, and now here he is at a at a Power Five program. Yeah, one of one of the up and coming names and coaches, and certainly in, in Virginia. With, with you mentioned all the places he's been, David. You mentioned the connection uh, with Brent Pry and Ricky Ronnie, and I'm curious. I, I don't I don't want to make too much. I'm curious. Is there any kind of gentleman's agreement here? Because Fontel Mines comes over from ODU. There's some guys at ODU who could be looking for, for a new home. Is that off limits to, to bring anybody with you? Or am I naive and this is college football in 2022 and nothing's off limits? Mike, you know the answer. <laughs> yeah, I was setting you up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are dreadfully naive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, it... it it's a fair point to ponder, and it makes perhaps the season opener between Old Dominion and Virginia Tech all the more curious. Right. We, we saw the reverse with, with Kuma and um, the, the tight end whose name is now uh, Cunningham, Chris yeah. Cunningham, Chris going Cunningham. over to ODU. I mean, and with with ODU winning a couple of years ago, that game's already got a little juice to it, but um, could be a fun fun little uh, wrinkle for it as well. How about the other side of things? V- Virginia, they made the Des Kitchings hire uh, official. Obviously, he's got a guy with some um, ACC ties and NFL experience. What, what, what are you making of what Tony Elliott is doing in Charlottesville? Well, at the risk of being provincial in my 757 roots, <laughs> Chris Slade yeah, is how about coming that? home to, to UVA to be a defensive assistant coach. Chris has spent the better part of a decade at Pace Academy down in the Atlanta area, and he, he attended Tony Elliott's introductory press conference raved about what a terrific recruiter Elliot was for Clemson when he came into Pace Academy. That's how Chris and and Tony first met. But Chris is Cavaliers royalty. I mean, he and Terry Kirby were a package deal out of Tab High School back in the late 80s and were part of two of the finest Virginia football teams in history, you know, in, in UVA history in 89 and 90. The 89 bunch that that shared the ACC title and uh, the the 90 team that uh, that ascended to number one in the rankings and went to the Sugar Bowl. David, I'm I'm curious if in this I'm asking you probably unless it's come up to speculate here. When do you think Elliot hiring Slade became a thing? Because I talked to Chris for a while at that introductory press conference. He was effusive in his praise of Tony Elliott. What a great hire! He was excited for the program. Um, but I also talked to him a lot about you know the passion that there was to, to bring Anthony Poindexter back. And that had been a big storyline. And um, he talked about, you know, how great that would have been. And it, we had a very, my point is we had a very candid and open and free flowing conversation. And unless he's got a great poker face, I never got the sense that, that this was on the radar. Do you think it was on the radar when he was there? Or is this something that um, maybe came to pass after that moment? I absolutely think it was on the radar. Uh, we, we, talked about it a little bit that day i've known chris for you know since he was in high school and i got the distinct impression he didn't come right out and say it mike but i got the distinct impression that he was interested in joining the staff and this this did not surprise me and it makes sense because one of the the things i talked to him about uh, i talked to chris long about uh i talked to uh, sean moore about uh was you, we heard it at Michigan with Harbaugh. You, you got to get a Michigan guy. You need a Michigan guy. And I asked him, I said, at Virginia, I said, do you need a Virginia guy? And they all had some variation of the same answer. You don't have to come to Virginia as a Virginia guy, but you got to quickly become one. Yeah. You, you have to embrace the past. I think that's true everywhere, right? You have to embrace the past. Um, you, you have to become a bit of a student of the history, um, a bit of a student of the place. Every place is a little different. 
And they all said, and maybe this was the hint that I didn't pick up on, was you got to have guys around the program um, who, who have been there, who have lived it. And bringing in Chris Slade, keeping Marcus Hagens, okay. keeping Clint Sintum. Clint Sintum. Right. Th- those are the moves that allow Tony Elliott to come in with all of his ability and, and his talents. And if he's missing that one part, the being a, a Virginia guy, boy, I think he's addressed that uh, in, in spades here with his hires. Yeah, ag- agreed. He will he will be a quick study, and he is he he has surrounded himself with institutional knowledge, and there's a lot to be said for that. Yeah, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be fun to see the vision these guys put on the field because you know we talked about it with Tech, which made their their hire of, of uh, Bowen as the offensive coordinator official, but they've also got a passing game coordinator who's known for slinging it around the yard, and and Joe Rudolph, who we talked about last week from Wisconsin, big power football, um, Des Kitchings his background, you know, what it is, but what is he going to want to do? What is he going to craft with Tony Elliott, with what Tony was doing at Clemson? I'm really intrigued, especially on the offensive side, um, because I don't think any of these hires give it away, right? There's nobody that you look at and you're like, okay, well, they're going to be air raid. They're going to be wishbone. Like, I'm just looking at smart, innovative, successful offensive coaches, um, which, hey, that bodes well for fans that, that like to see some good offense here in the Commonwealth. Well, Mike, I get, I get my days confused as to when we recorded and when things happened. <laughs> I, I, I don't think we've talked since Virginia Tech got the two quarterbacks in the portal. Right, because so, the last time we recorded, was you and Tuesday, I said, right? and you and I said, one of the things that's going to shape that vision is – Who's playing quarterback? Does Brendan Armstrong come back at UVA? And, and since then, you're right. We've seen Tech add Wells from Marshall, uh, Johnson, I believe, from South Carolina. Brown. Brown, sorry. I knew it was a, a very common last name. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah w- before we go then, let's let's talk. W- what what do we know about those quarterbacks? And does that give us a clue to maybe uh, where the Hokies might be heading in terms of style? Well, Jason Brown toured up at, at the FCS level for St. Francis went to South Carolina, and I believe he started four games for Shane Beamer this year, went two and two as a starter, uh, was probably more of the game manager type than than anything else. And then when Spencer Rattler transferred from Oklahoma, where obviously he knew Shane, to South Carolina, I think Brown saw the saw the handwriting there and, and, and decided to look elsewhere. And then Grant Wells at, at Marshall a, a, as a freshman was just terrific in, in, in 2020 and had had Marshall at 7-0 and and ranked 15th in, in the country. But then the herd lost its last three games um, and the staff got fired. That staff included J.C. Price. Who obviously knew Grant Wells, so then, <laughs> boom! J.C. Price ends up at Virginia Tech. J.C. Price makes a phone call the minute Grant Wells hits the portal, and it it just goes from there. It's it's all about connections. The one thing that that strikes me about Wells's numbers: a lot of yards, a lot of touchdown passes, a lot of picks. So th- th- that's something they will they will have to rein in, but it, it's certainly going to make. And both of them are coming in for the spring, which is which is so essential, and which makes spring ball for Virginia Tech. You've got the the two transfers, you've got Blumrick, you've got Bullock. All of a sudden, the quarterback room has become crowded, and spring practice doubly intriguing yep and, and and other positions on that offense as well that are being remade through the transfer portal uh through some opportunity for young guys it's it's going to be fun it's going to be fun to to get into football and um but we got a lot of basketball david a lot of basketball before we get to that point so thank you for listening you can subscribe to teal and barber on apple podcasts or wherever you find your favorite pods and please consider supporting local journalism with an online subscription to the td You can find special promotional offers available at richmond.com. Today's show was produced by Dean Hoffmeyer, who none of us believe was coming off the bench in basketball games. He's clearly a starter. (laughs) Thiel and Barber is a podcast of the Richmond Times Dispatch at richmond.com. For David Thiel, I'm Mike Barber. Thanks for listening. Be healthy and safe. And please join David and me again next time. 